When they do well, companies' managements get very high bonuses. They have therefore an incentive to get those metrics up. And when you change incentives, you change behavior. And the behavior change was that management became much more anxious to make short-term profits for themselves than they had to worry about the long-term future of their companies. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary people from all around the world. In this series, I have invited one of them, namely Kevin Coldine, to host a series of in-depth conversations to help uncover and explain new ideas to make you a better investor. In the series, Kevin will be speaking to authors of new books and research papers to better understand the global economy and the dynamics that shape it so that we can all successfully navigate the challenges within it. And with that, please welcome Kevin Coldiron. All right. Uh, thank you, Niels, and welcome, everyone. Um, so our guest today is uh, one of the investment world's best-known financial economists, Andrew Smithers. Um, Andrew has spent a career studying how markets behave, how market participants behave, and how policymakers ought to <laughs> take account of that behavior in their own decisions. Um, he's someone who's uh, not afraid at all to challenge consensus ideas, and some of those challenges are what we're going to be talking about today. Um, by way of career background, he's been um, head of S.G. Warburg's asset management business, which is now part of BlackRock, as are, as are many investment businesses. Um, he's the founder of Smithers & Co., which is a, the economics consultancy firm, and I was lucky enough to have been a client of his for many years. Um, many of you will have read his work in the FT, as well as the London Times, and most recently the uh, Journal of American Affairs. Um, he has published six books, I think if I've got the count right, and the last of which is The Economics of the Stock Market, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So um, with that, um, Andrew, welcome uh, to the show and thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. So I, I thought maybe we could start at the end, start with what to me seemed like the key conclusions or messages um, from the book and then kind of work our way through the, the how you got there. So to me, the what, what you're saying is, hey, look, there's two relationships that need to be kept in balance in order to promote economic stability. The first one is the difference between desired savings and desired investment. Um, and the second, where the stock market comes in, is the difference between the market value of equity and the underlying network, um, that difference, uh, that ratio is what you call Q. And you're saying that we need to have both those things uh, balanced if we want a stable growth. And that, that seems kind of intuitive to me, certainly, and I think probably to a lot of listeners, but that's not how economists and policymakers focus. They really focus exclusively on that first relationship, the balance between the desire to save and the desire to invest. And in doing so, they create imbalances in the second relationship. And that ultimately has the effect of making the economy less stable, not more. So is that, would you agree with that as a summary of your, the last couple of years of work uh, for you? I agree with your analysis, which was uh, very well put. The points that you're making have 
been made by other economists, notably uh, Nobel laureate George Akerlof and uh, MIT professor Ricardo Caballero. Um, they have questioned whether the consensus uh, model of the economy is correct in that particular regard, i.e. the claim that there is only one equilibrium which policy needs to manage for the economy to be stable is something that they doubt. I've gone one stage further. I have shown that there is at least one other equilibria that needs to be maintained, which is, as you correctly say, the relationship between net worth of companies and their stock market value. And I show that if you continue a policy which is too strongly uh, aimed at getting the balance in the demand correctly, and you do that particularly by having very low interest rates, and particularly if you continue to intervene in the bond market by purchases of what's called quantitative easing, you can easily create a situation in which the Q ratio goes up to a dangerous level. And frankly, that's what we've had recently and have now. Let's talk about that Q ratio. Can you just give us a little, since that plays a kind of central role um, in your analysis, can you just explain a little bit about how that's constructed? Yes. Um, companies obviously have uh, a market capitalization, the value of their equity, i.e. the number of shares they have outstanding times the value of each individual share. That is the market value of the company, equity. The, the, there's also a net worth, which is the equity value of the company, measured not in terms of the stock market, but in terms of the assets which it owns. And those assets are derived by surveys conducted in the American case or by the BEA. And the BEA conduct regular surveys of what is the value of second-hand equipment. And from that, they compose data on net worth of the corporate sector. And also the speed with which that net worth changes, they use to determine depreciation. Now, if the stock market value and the underlying net worth is large. If stock markets are much higher, then you have a high value of Q. And this is unstable. Q is a mean reverting series. It gets pushed up temporarily by low interest rates, but that impact doesn't last. When it starts to decline, the problem faces the economy is that when share prices fall, they fall much faster than they rise. And if you then get a very sharp fall in the stock market, which is no longer, I think, likely to be able to be maintained by low interest rates, particularly if you've got inflation picking up, then you've got a handful of trouble on your, on your hands, a great deal of trouble on your hands, and very often you will then get a financial crisis. And the trouble now is that we have the conditions precedent, not necessary, but precedent for another financial crisis, having not long had the nasty serious one of 2008. So ultimately what, what you're saying is when the Q ratio gets out of balance, um, as it as it is now, that creates the potential for a financial crisis. Um, and that's something that hasn't been kind of part of the decision-making process of, of policymakers thus far. I think that is correct. I had one, must be nameless, but extremely senior central banker saying to me, oh, but central bankers are aware of the problem. It's not, it is their fault when they go get it wrong. Um, and I, because I was arguing that the fault largely lies with 
economic uh, theory. But, and I said to him or wrote to him that I did not think it was entirely fair to blame the central bankers because if they don't have a consensus policy to refer to, they have great difficulty in saying to the world, well, we're worried about Q uh, and we're therefore going to put up interest rates. And everybody will say to them, but that's going to put up unemployment. Uh, they say, well, tough titty, tough, tough <laughs> luck. Uh, and that is not a very easy thing to do. What we need is a general appreciation, a much more general appreciation, that there are these two disequilibria, that the central banks cannot be responsible for maintaining two separate equilibrium. If you have two problems, you need two, at least two policy tools to deal with it. You can rely on the central banks to get the balance and demand there, but you need to do something else. And I am suggesting that we can do that uh, by adapting the tax system so that it changes the weight of taxation without increasing or decreasing the budget deficit. But if you increase taxes on consumption and incomes and reduce taxes on investment, you should manage to achieve a stimulus to the economy with no change in the level of the budget deficit. I mean, let's well, let's talk about that. That that's kind of one of the key conclusions of your book um, and with key recommendations is that we need to generate more investment without increasing the budget deficit. Do you think that what you've just recommended is something kind of changing the tax structure? Is that something that would need to be done, kind of fine tuned in the same way that interest rates? are fine-tuned, or do you imagine that being more of a kind of a structural change that gets revisited on occasion? I, I hope it would definitely be the second, uh, because it seems to me that if you manage to get demand in balance uh, with the wishes to invest and to save, then you will be able to control the economy with its short wrinkles uh, by uh, changes in monetary policy. But you're hit on a very important point. It's obviously that you don't want to have to use major changes in taxation uh, for controlling the short-term fluctuations in the economy. This has long been put forward as a reason why you really need monetary policy. You can't just balance demand by budget deficits because you can't quickly change them. But it applies also uh, to changing the structure of taxation between consumption taxes and in taxes on investment. I must admit, I do think taxes on investment, when we are in a very slow growth economy, both sides of the Atlantic is just downright foolish anyway. Um, I know that you said that UK has recently raised the corporation tax, but then they've tried to offset that with a tax credit on investment. Do you think that's a kind of move in the right direction? Absolutely. Um, I don't mind what the rate of corporation tax is, provided that nobody pays it. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, what we've got, therefore, in the UK already, but initially only as a temporary measure, which is pretty useless, uh, it was a increase in the corporation tax rate. But at the same time, a tax credit was introduced for tangible investment. Both sides of the Atlantic have tax credits for intangible investment. And what we badly need to see is large tax credits for intangible, for tangibles as well. I want to go back to Q a little bit and its usefulness as a measure of value. Because you you introduced some concepts in the book that I think a lot of the listeners would be uh, would be interested in because a lot of our listeners are involved in the markets and so therefore measuring value is something that's pretty important to them. So you talk about when you look at the history of equity returns that real returns to equity. So once we adjust for their inflation value are 
what you call stationary, which is kind of like a fancy statistical term for saying, hey, they, t- they tend to rotate around some fairly stable number, which is roughly 7%, a little below 7%. So you're saying if we look at equity returns over long horizons, they rotate around this value of 7%. Doesn't mean equity returns are going to be 7% next year, just over a long enough period um, once you adjust for inflation. And then you say, based on that, we can look back in the past and we can say whether or not equity markets were expensive or cheap at some point in the past using using this idea of what you call hindsight value. Can you can you explain that you know that idea to us a little bit? Yeah, I owe hindsight value uh, to my co-author, uh, valuing Wall Street, who's Professor Stephen Wright, uh, and I think it's a very important development. Clearly you know from history uh, whether markets are expensive or cheap, i.e. nobody doubts they were not very expensive in 1929 and very cheap in 1932. Why? Because hindsight tells us that. We know afterwards you get bought bad returns from one and good returns from the other. So the question is then, how do we quantify that more, more precisely? How do you judge whether a market on a particular date was expensive or cheap? And if so, importantly, by how much? Now, to do that, Stephen invented this concept of hindsight value. What he pointed out was that you can't judge a market's return over a set period of time. If you say, ah, I'm going to say that markets are cheap in the past if they gave a high return over the next 10 years. Because that merely may mean that you are judging it up to the next peak. It may not have been very cheap at all. It may just have gone up a lot in the next 10 years. So what you need to do is to take the average of all possible holding periods over any given period of time. But how long do you need is then the question. We have data for 220 years, and obviously, if we have to use 100 years of data, we can't tell very much uh, from because we've got so much we can't use. And so what I do in the book is I show that you can use 30 years as hindsight values, because if you then compare 30 years with longer term periods, the answers are almost exactly the same. Uh, hindsight value made over 30 years is almost identical with hindsight value over 50. Therefore, if you've got at least 30 years of data uh, in, for hindsight, i.e. you can now measure the value of market using hindsight from 1801, where Jeremy Siegel's very valuable data series starts, right up to uh, 30 years ago, i.e. to 1990. And having got values which are now definite, they are historical values, they're not forecasts or anything like that, or you can see whether you have a metric which will give you a good fit to those. And we show that there are two metrics which give you a good fit uh, to hindsight value. One is Q, and the other is the cyclically adjusted PE or CAPE. And you find the the fit by measuring the R-squared correlation. The R-squared for Q is extremely high. It's 0.8. It's pretty good for CAPE, which is 0.52. So you have pretty good two guides. And obviously, since CAPE is not quite as good as Q, but in fact, quite significantly less good, I tend to use Q as the number one with CAPE, as it were, as the number two backup. And there's a reason, which I can explain later, perhaps, uh, about why how they differ. So just if I can uh, I summarize what you're saying is, with this concept of hindsight value, we can go back to 1800, and kind of at each point, or let's just say each year from 1800 on till 30 years ago, we have a pretty good estimate of whether the market was cheap or expensive at that point in time. And then we can we can see how well 
your measure of Q or Robert Schiller's measure of CAPE matches up against that. And that tells us whether or not they're valid measures of value. And um, you're saying that you know, Q turns out to be, a, you know, on that basis, a very good measure of whether the market was cheap or expensive in the past. And therefore, um, it tells us something about whether the market is cheap or expensive now. Is that exactly? Okay, that is exactly correct. So, if I look at Q, how it how it's evolved, let's say in the last thirty years, for almost the whole time since nineteen ninety ish, it's been in you know what you might call overvalued territory in the sense of above its its long term average, and, and for a lot of that time, it's been you know well above that average, very very expensive. So one of the things I hear about, one of the criticisms I guess or skepticisms about Q as a measure of value is it always says the market is expensive, right? It's It's been an overvalued territory for 30 years. So how can it be a valid measure of value if it's always saying the market is expensive? Well, clearly, if it was always saying the market was expensive, um, it would be an upside-down stockbroker, wouldn't it? Who always <laughs> the market's cheap. Um, and of course, it doesn't. Um, it has. Uh, if, if it always said the market was expensive, it wouldn't fit with hindsight value. It does fit with hindsight value, so that criticism is invalid. Does it th- then mean that there's some kind of structural forces, if you will, that have come together to keep it above its fair value since? 1990 or so? Well, it hasn't been entirely above its fair value since 1990. It went below that in 2008 that I remember. I, yes, I'm, for a little bit. Ger- Ger- yeah, for a little bit, but quite a lot. Uh, but, uh, Jeremy Grantham tells me that uh, it bottomed at the devil's number of 666, uh, which <laughs> when one's looking at the value today, it's just worth remembering. That is quite a jump. But you're correct, it has been high, particularly in the last few years, uh, at exceptionally high levels for quite a long time. And yes, I do attribute this to a change. It's a change which I consider a very bad one. It's the change I was talking about, which is the way in which monetary policy, if misapplied, can cause instability in the economy. And monetary policy has done just that. We are looking at a economy which is dangerously uh, liable to to fall because of the disequilibrium and that policy which has is the result that level is the result of monetary policy not only low interest rates but in particular of quantitative easing which has had a very very strong impact I believe and is fairly unique frankly uh, in history terms, uh, a very, very strong impact on putting the market up for an extended period of time at very high levels. You talk about, so let's kind of follow through on that. How how precisely or how in your your framework does quantitative easing lead to this Q ratio becoming out of balance and and therefore creating, you know, potential instability in, uh, in the economy? In the book, I show that companies prefer to borrow long. Uh, If you've got your debt in the short term, you're very liable to have trouble if you have interest rates going up in the short run, particularly in in inflation. Uh, Because the short-term impact of inflation on on short-term interest rates is far bigger than it is on profits. If you get a a pari passu change in interest rates uh, from, say, uh, 1% to 2%, because there's an increase of 1% in inflation, and you're all borrowed short, your debt payments will go up by 50%, while your profits have gone up by 1%. And while that's an extreme example, it's not too irrelevant in today's Mm. or near, near today's conditions. Uh, Therefore, companies prefer to borrow at the long end. And uh, I show that if if you exclude wartime conditions from the data that we have, you show that companies like to keep a level of debt 
which is consistent with having, roughly speaking, and I'm drawing from memory here, a cover of five times between uh, their profits after depreciation, but before tax and interest, relative to the payments of interest. Now that therefore means that companies' willingness to, to borrow is very much dependent on the nominal rate of long bonds. And therefore, when uh, the Federal Reserve went in and flattened the yield curve, i.e. brought long bond yields down nearer towards short-term rates than they would otherwise have been, they encouraged companies to borrow. And now what happens when companies borrow, they can either use the money to buy back shares or they can use the money to invest. Well, frankly, they've been using it to buy back shares. And the natural result of buying back a lot of shares, it, or put literally, if, if a company goes out and buys a share and nobody's a seller, the price of the stock market goes to infinity. So you have to get somebody else to sell. Uh, it, is as, it is as difficult as that. So companies buying are a very powerful influence on pushing the stock market up. And the reason that companies buy is a wish to do so, uh, because that is the way that they are remunerated. The abandonment is remunerated by high share prices and the ability to do so, which comes when you get the Fed to drive down the rate of long bond yields. So you, you touched on um, a, a couple of things, and, and something we, I've written about this quite a bit myself is that if you, you actually look at the data in the U.S. Um, on a net basis, the only consistent purchaser of U.S. equities has been companies uh, buying back their own shares. It's kind of on a sectoral basis. For every buyer, there has to be a seller, and the key key kind of buyer has been um, has been companies. You mentioned that incentives for company managers. And it seemed to me that that forms a, you know, a key kind of piece of your argument and why, you know, why Q may have become elevated, um, certainly cyclically, but potentially structurally as well. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that, on, on how the change, and I think what you call the bonus culture or the remuneration policies has led to a kind of a a um, un consistent underinvestment and and, and therefore an increase in the value of Q. Yes, thank you. Yes, this was the subject of my previous book. A couple of years ago, I published a book called Productivity in the Bonus Culture. Now, what I showed at that was something which was quite well known, so it was just illustrating a well-known point, which was there was a dramatic change in the way companies' managements were remunerated in the 1990s. Um, the introduction of bonuses and went along actually at the same time with often very considerably high increases in actual annual pay as well. But the bonus element was what mattered. Because of bonuses, the remuneration of management went up relative to everybody else by a huge jump. But those that got that extra money did so because the return on their shares was very good. Either the share price itself or the earnings per share or very often what's called total shareholder value, TPS, whatever it is, a combination of the dividend plus uh, the share price. When they do well, companies managements get very high bonuses. They have therefore an incentive to get those metrics up. And when you change incentives, you change behavior. After all, that's what incentives are for. And the behavior change was that management became much more anxious to make short-term profits for themselves than they had to worry about the long-term future of their companies. Now, in the new book, I go into this in a little more detail in some respects. I say that basically I think there are two main motives for company managements. Number one is to keep your job 
And number two is to get as well paid as possible while you're keeping your job. Now, they're not the only incentives. I'm not saying that people are universally wicked, bad, awful. But I'm saying those are important motives and they will naturally have a very large input on behavior. If you don't invest, you are at risk of your company falling behind its competitors because your productivity won't improve as fast as theirs. So not investing is a risk. So if you change the incentives, however, so that you put more money on, more incentive on getting rich, you will naturally switch the balance away from investing towards getting rich. And in doing so, people invest less. So what we've seen is a weakness, which is well known, uh, in corporate investment in the last decade or so. And with that, by the way, has gone the fall in productivity, uh, which is why I call my previous book Productivity and the Bonus Culture. I, I want to pick up on a little bit more on the, the incentives for management because I, I really like the way you talked about it um, and then also the how that kind of leads to another long-term uh, relationship, which is kind of the the stability between interest payments and, and profits um, over time. So you you talk about managers wanting to manage leverage of the company in a way that is, you know, but there's a certain degree of leverage that's needed, but you don't want to have too much. Can you talk more about the the incentives for managing the the, the ultimate the, the level of leverage? Because that has to, you know, that obviously plays into it when you buy back shares because you're in, you know, you're increasing uh, you're increasing leverage on the balance sheet when you do that. Okay. Well, as I mentioned, uh, keeping your job. Uh, is possibly the single highest uh, important thing of importance for, 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 for management. Now, what are the threats to your job? Well, the big threat to the job is a sudden fall in the share price uh, or being taken over. Now, if you are under leveraged, you are very vulnerable to being taken over because obviously a company of otherwise identical status in terms of abilities, prospects, everything else, uh, could buy you and gear up their balance sheet, and they would find that their earnings per share had gone up. Their leverage would then become the combined leverage, and you would be out of a job, probably, because the, the, one of the usual things that happens when you get taken over is the senior management say goodbye. So that is a, th a threat you want to avoid, so you don't want to be under leveraged. However, if you are very highly leveraged, you have a threat which is not necessarily bankruptcy, uh, although that will that's the ultimate threat of being over leveraged. But the biggest short-term threat being highly leveraged is if you have a sudden drop uh, in profits, and this is goes with the economy, not with the management can't control profits. Uh, it's, they can try and do as well as they can, but, they, but you will find they are at mercy of the swings and arrows of the economy. So companies are always at risk of sudden falls in profits. Now, if you are highly leveraged and you have a sudden fall in profits, you have to then go to shareholders for more money. And it is an interesting feature of the way in which shareholders behave. They don't mind companies running quite large savings in terms of the dividend not being all the profits. Uh, they don't see, there's no great big shock. Companies are largely priced on PE multiples rather than dividend yields. So unless you're outrageously mean, you'll find that uh, increasing your equity by co corporate retentions doesn't do you any damage with the shareholders. If, on the other hand, you need to increase your equity by going to them for a new issue, the effect of new issues is almost invariably a very sharp fall in the share price. So, therefore, we are in this situation which is very clear. 
under leveraging risks your job because it risks you being taken over. Over leveraging risks your job because it risks you suddenly having to go to the shareholders for a new equity issue and being sacked or suffering badly because of the sharp drop in share prices. It's it's funny you mentioned the uh, the dislike of investors of of rights issues. Uh, one of the examples I I use in my class to talk about the quantitative models we used used to use at my firm for investing was a company called Orlicon, a Swiss company that um, had got over leveraged um, uh, in the um, uh, early two thousands. Had to issue a rights issue. Share price collapsed and. Subsequently, they turned the business around. I mean, the rights issue ha- helped shore up the balance sheet. They turned the, the business around. Sales started growing. Profits started growing. All those metrics. Um, so the, our model, which had no kind of emotional connection to the rights issue, said, hey, this looks like a good company, profitable company. But the multiple stayed low for a long time because people were they felt burned from um, from the rights issue. And it ended up being a good Opportunity, so yeah, I I, I agree that uh, that that really resonated with me. The fact that uh, the market dislikes um, rights issues, and that's a risk to being over leveraged. So what you what I thought was interesting and uh, or kind of clever about this analysis is you said, okay, then based on that notion that managers don't want to be over or under leveraged, that leads to a kind of a stable relationship or a mean reverting, I should say, relationship between interest payments and profits. So that if we look in the same way that Q or um, the real equity returns is stationary, the ratio of interest payments to profits is also something that's stationary over time. Is that correct, Mike? Yes, there is, however, one exception to that, which is if you're not allowed to borrow at the, in the long bond yield, uh, you then tend to find that you can't borrow. And so what happened in, in wartime when the long bond market was restricted to government issues, you found that company balance sheets became much less leveraged. Uh, and there was a sharp, right, sharp fall in leverage from the outbreak of war till I, the end of the war. Uh, and after that, it recovered only, it came down again quite fast, but it took some while. So it's only if you exclude uh, the bit uh, between wartime and the return back to the normal ratio, uh, you can measure the mean reversion of that ratio. You must allow for uh, exceptional things. John Kay and Mervyn King have recently written a very book good book called Radical Uncertainty, which emphasizes that you must allow for what's called Knightian uncertainty, i.e. you cannot use statistical tests when you don't have any examples or ways to use them. And Frank Knight in the 1920s wrote about this and something that Keynes also agreed with. Some people don't, but it seems to me very important when you're looking at a data series, uh, you must exclude from that data series things which are unpredictable, total one-off events which nobody can judge. For example, you cannot include in statistics for uh, stock market worldwide when an economy and a stock market like Russia, like Pet- St. Petersburg in 1917, was taken out completely. That is a one-off. It doesn't hit on people's expectations about what's going to happen in the future because you can't say, well, had that happened, what's what's the chance of it happening again? Another example is World War II. The capital stock of Germany and uh, Japan in particular, but also of others, was massively destroyed in in the Second World War. Now, you don't recover from that. You don't get the returns on that capital when it isn't there. So again, you can't use the data of Germany and Japan covering the Second World War period uh, when you're looking at what expected returns are. 
some people try and do that. They say, ah, well, let's include uh, the risks of world wars. I really don't think it's very sensible. I don't know that I can measure the risks of World War Three in terms of what happened in World War Two. Is it going to be similar? <laughs> I mean, it's just not. It's just. It's just something. It's just not something that you can sensibly do. You have to allow for nighty and uncertainty. I, I agree with you. Although, having spent a kind of a career looking at data, it is also can be a danger, right? Because you've got to be careful about not throwing out all outliers. Um, you, you have to. You have to have a, a kind of a framework for saying, well, which of these extreme events fits within my, you know, the kind of world that I, that I think is quote unquote normal and which, which don't, right? Because throwing out outliers can change statistical relationships quite dramatically. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the counterpart of failing to take note of nighty and uncertainty is of course to think that it affects everything. So you can never make any judgment about anything. Uh, and uh, there is obviously a risk uh, that people will get so uh, concerned or use it all the time as any excuse for whatever they wish to think. You're absolutely right. Now, I think that the right answer to this is the correct answer of uh, all the sciences, uh, which is to try and use rational argument. It's only by understanding. This is the purpose of science is to understand and the debate that contributes whether we know something or not, we know never know anything for certain. But whether we have a better model in this one than that one is a matter of debate and discussion. So when it comes to the question of whether you exclude things from night and uncertainty or not, then I think there is no substitute but for open debate on the issues for people to judge then which is the, the, the right model to use. And judging from the history of science and the history of even of economics, when people do that, it doesn't usually prove a huge and insuperable barrier to coming to a reasonable agreement. Do you think um, when we look at this, you know, the notion that, you know, managers kind of try to balance under and over leverage and that that keeps, that uh, aside from World War II, that, that, we've got this kind of fairly stable relationship between interest payments and profits. Is that also a measure or a tool that policymakers ought to be focusing on in the same way they focus on, or you suggest they should focus on Q? Well, I think it's more uh, so they understand why they shouldn't indulge in quantitative easing. If the data are correct, then they will simply find that when quantitative easing takes place, the stock market goes roaring up and people get more leveraged. Remarked earlier, Kevin, correctly, that one difference between consensus models and the critiques of consensus theory is this belief that there is only one equilibrium we have to preserve. Showing that Q is another one doesn't mean there aren't others. I personally expect that where there is another disequilibrium, which is excessive debt, but I can't demonstrate the levels at which that becomes excessive. I haven't been able to find out ways of showing uh, that X level is too dangerous or not. So, and also I suspect that's quite tricky because I think that the level of excess debt goes a bit with the level of inflation. So you have to be quite careful about that. But if it is, if it is then, uh, it means actually that in practice, we probably don't have to worry too much about debt levels considered in isolation, because I, I, it is quite clear that debt and Q do go together to some extent. And I doubt if you'll find that with Q at a reasonable level that you've got to worry about over level, over over leveraging yeah, in the economy. So if policymakers, let's say, adopted your um, your suggestion that they keep an eye, at, more than keep an eye, that, that they actively incorporate Q into their decision-making policy, uh, 
monetary policymakers don't have control over taxes. So are you saying that they should simply just make their decisions on interest rates with an eye toward the the level of Q? So they, they may leave interest rates, they may have interest rates higher than than would they think is necessary if they just looked at the desired level of savings versus investment because higher interest rates are necessary to keep Q in line? I think this is a very uh, interesting subject. Uh, What extent would central bankers be justified in turning to the government and saying, look, Q is dangerously high, or if we cut interest rates anymore, it will become dangerously high. We therefore cannot stimulate the economy anymore by monetary means. You must therefore take this on your, it's on. It's now on your watch, not mine. We are here to make sure that, that inflation doesn't say go above 2% or whatever target you have. But what we are not able to do when we follow that is to also secure full employment uh, if we are unable to control dangerous levels of Q. Over to you. Now, at the moment, I think that would probably be a very difficult thing to say. And that's why I was defending central bankers when I said it wasn't entirely their fault um, uh, to another central banker. Uh, and uh, I think that it is, we do need to get a major change in economic consensus. Changing the model of economics used in economic policy is a step to allowing monetary policy to be effective. It, it's, a, it's an interesting point. I mean, in our, the conclusion to our book, we talk about, you know, we're going to need changes, quite big changes in the in the structure of how, you know, policy is done. And really what, as you were saying that, I'm thinking, well, you know, we, we it wasn't that long ago that central bankers did, did not have inflation targets. I mean, inflation targeting what is a relatively new uh, phenomenon in the history of central banks. So it's not crazy to say that, uh, you know, maybe... Q targeting could be something that's introduced. I mean, is that ultimately what you're hoping would happen? Um, I don't think Q targeting should really fall into central bankers. I'm saying if you if you accept that there's more than one disequilibrium out there uh, to control two dis- to avoid the possibility of two different disequilibria, you need different policy tools. And I'm suggesting that monetary policy is not a suitable policy tool for stimulating the economy uh, once Q gets up 20, 30, 40% above its average value. And therefore, what I'm saying is that in the world which we look forward to, you and I, Q, uh, Kevin, in which everybody understands that they've got the wrong model then, Back then, in 1922, they had a bad model. We've got another much better one. Once, they, once they've got to that uh, improved uh, level of paradise, uh, we will be able to get uh, policy, uh, having two policy tools, but they will not both be operated by central banks. The two disequilibrium I'm talking about require two different policy tools, one of those policy tools will be and should remain with the central banks. The other has got to come, I think, from government. So really what you're, you're imagining is a world where central banks are able to say uh, without any shame, hey, look, um, we've reached the limit of what we think we can sensibly do with interest rates, given where Q is. We need changes to, you know, the corporation tax, we need changes to the incentive to invest or consume to bring that back into to balance. Absolutely. If we've got a world in which that is accepted, the central bankers won't have to say anything uh, because you and other analysts will be pointing out and saying, look, look, <laughs> Treasury Department, uh, the queue is at this dangerous level. 
uh, obviously the uh, Fed will not be able to cut interest rates anymore if there's any weakness. It's up to you. You must uh, now do the pretty. To some extent, that already exists with the budget deficit. But the budget deficit is, uh, uh, creates its own problems. At the moment, we do have two separate tools for, for controlling the economy. One is monetary policy and the other is fiscal policy. But both of these create debt. Monetary policy creates debt in the private sector. Fiscal policy in its current form creates debt in the public sector. And there are political li limits and quite probably real limits to how much you need to increase or can afford to increase the size of government debt levels. As, as Japan has shown, it's by no means clear that they're that low. That may be that people should at the moment, and I certainly think it would have been better to have stimulated the US economy in the last decade by fiscal stimulus rather than monetary. But I don't think it's not enough. I think that the fiscal management has to include not only the size of the budget deficit, but the distribution of taxation between consumption, income, taking of therefore a proxy for consumption to one extent, and investment. And at the moment, therefore, quite clearly, we need to reduce the taxes on investment, which are corporation tax net of any credits that you get for investing. And we need to increase the taxes on VAT in the UK or uh, sales taxes in America or income taxes. Of course, that isn't, the politicians won't not necessarily want to hear that <laughs> because people, people would rather not have their consumption taxed. But unfortunately, if they don't have the consumption tax, they'll have their investment taxed and their future will be pretty grim. It is a question that you have to, uh, in any democracy, one of the first essentials is to educate voters. Yeah, and, and we, in some ways, the, the notion that having the stock market way out of value, uh, way out of line with its fundamental value, at, at one level that might seem like kind of an esoteric concept, but I actually think given the involvement that people have day to day, in the markets now with defined contribution plans, they're much more engaged with, with the stock market and they have a better understanding of, you know, how it potentially could impact the economy. So I don't think it's a wholly um, unrealistic idea to, you know, to eventually incorporate that into, into policy making decisions. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that that could be done down the road. Um, you, you mentioned um, your conversations with central bankers, and that um, you know, although you couldn't couldn't name them in public, that there is some recognition that what you've been talking about in terms of Q um, is important. Th that surprised me a little bit because, you know, I remember very clearly Alan Greenspan saying, "Well, hey, there's no way we can identify bubbles ahead of time, um, so we're just going to sit back and you know." wait till they pop and then when they pop we'll um we'll clean up afterwards i think he called it the kind of risk management approach which i think in the end has been very damaging and has just only served to um kind of reinforce some of these instabilities do you do you think that 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 kind of idea that greenspan approaches um no longer kind of consensus within central bankers undoubtedly um I don't think central bankers quite know what to do, uh, but they do, I think, know what they shouldn't do, but they, um, but they may not be able to avoid it. Stephen Wright and I published a paper which we called The Economic Consequences of Alan Greenspan. We published it in the Journal of World Economics, and we were very critical of that and of other central bankers who made what we thought at the time outrageously optimistic assumptions about the ability to control the economy by central banking alone. Uh, Stephen invented the, the phrase that we had not only a problem of convincing people against this f folly of the efficient market hypothesis, 
but also against the folly of the efficient central bankers hypothesis. Uh, and I think that advance is certainly made. And immediately after the last crisis, there was a large number of people saying, oh, central bankers must now take note of asset prices. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, that died down. There's an old adage, you should not lose the benefit of a good crisis. We lost the benefit of that last crisis. I hope we will at least remember that. And if we have another crisis, and I fear we are going to, uh, we will not lose its benefits when we come to reassess policy and economic theory. Well, I I, I agree with you. I, I think that is going to be tested, um, unfortunately. And uh, it will be much trickier now because... Um, with higher inflation flooding the market with liquidity in, in the aftermath of a of a of a crash in asset prices is, I think, going to be immediately recognized as highly inflationary. So that will be much trickier to to see how they manage that. So I want to I want to thank you for for joining us. It's been it's been real a, a real honor for me to be able to talk to you. Now I I want to ask you one final question. My my ex business partner once said something to me. I, I'm not a native of California. I live in California now, right on a, a fault line. And when I first moved here, I got very anxious about earthquakes and the the impact of earthquakes. And I did a lot of preparation. And he said to me, "Look, if there's a bad earthquake, as long as you have a fresh supply of water, dried food, and all your Smithers reports to read, you'll be fine." <laughs> And so uh, the question is, are there going to be more Smithers reports? Is there going to be another uh, follow-up book? What, what are your plans for going forward? Well, uh, let me make this remark. Uh, I'm, I've already issued invitations for people to come to my 85th birthday, which is due in September. And clearly, when you get to 85... <laughs> Time-swinged chariots speed uh, is is notably uh, faster uh, for you if you're any wit. So I do know that I haven't necessarily got a great deal of time, uh, and I would like to do more if I can. When I'm trying very hard to get the ideas which I set out in the economics of the stock market, broadly understood and debated. So one of the things I'm grateful to you, Kevin, for is your efforts in that direction. But I recognize that if you start saying, listen to my ideas, you are also probably wanting some sort of boost to yourself on that. Motives are almost always mixed. Vanity is probably uh, part of anybody who writes a book. But I hope and believe that my motives are not entirely vanity. They are pro bono. And I would like to continue to that. And at the moment, my energies are engaged in promulgating as much as I can the ideas set out in the economics of the stock market. And I hope to be writing I doubt whether I shall write another book, but I'm not going to say no. I never say never. Uh, I know, try not to. Uh, but I certainly expect and propose to be writing papers uh, and articles. And in, in, I did, after all, publish the article in American Affairs after uh, I had published the book, and I published several things which I, uh, I think I've also had things published in other journals like World Economics. And I will hope to continue to do that. So that's going to be my aim. I think they will probably be largely concentrated on the ideas in the book. But there is at least one other, which is very much in my mind, which is that standard growth theory is, I think, wrong. But one way in which it's wrong, I think, is would be quite widely recognized, which is that it has no scope for the environment or raw materials in it. And what happens is that in standard theory, the negative consequences of changes in the environment are simply included in the speed of depreciation. And what I think we are witnessing today 
uh, is that as the environment probably is deteriorating quite too faster than before, you'll get more negative consequences from that. Uh, if the water doesn't run through the uh, Hoover Dam, electricity goes down. And that it, it, those sorts of instances become more common if we get climate change. Uh, ports will fill, silt up faster and require more repairs. Hurricanes will do more damage. I suspect that we're already at the beginning of a stage in which we've started to suffer from environmental damage. And I think it's possible to begin to isolate that uh, from uh, other forms of depreciation. Depreciation in the standard model, uh, the famous uh, solo tobin uh, Weissacker model, is depreciation comes from the rise in real wages. Because if real wages go up, the value of your existing capital stock goes down because you don't get new out increased output for the unchanged capital stock. Nearly all increased output from improvements in capital has to be embedded in new equipment. Inventions do not increase productivity for the most part unless you invest with them. And this has been a major fault in a lot of people's understanding of the economy because tangible investment is essential for growth. And the proportion of total investment, which is anyway quite weak, which is tangible, has been falling in recent years quite markedly. We need, hence, when I was talking about the need for credits, we need the credits to extend to tangible investment and not just to be only on intangible. But if we do that, do that we will then recognize, I think, that we need to invest more. And because the capital stock which we are using doesn't only deteriorate in its value because wages go up, but it deteriorates in its value because the environment changes. So that is an additional point. Uh, but I would like to see, therefore, new work done on that. But I've also, in my own sphere, the work I've been doing, there is huge scope, I think, if economists can be persuaded to take their eyes away from the consensus theory, to look at the stock market model, because it provides immense scope for very valuable contributions by economists who will use that model. Well, I uh, I hope you do follow up on those ideas. And um, I know that I had in my notes, I wanted to talk about the difference between tangible and intangible investments, because you make some really good points about um, why certain things, intangible investments, really shouldn't be um, considered um, investment. I, and so for, for people out there, um, that's uh, that's one good reason to to read the book. Um, we haven't had a chance to talk about that. There's also, um, in addition to the book, there's uh, Andrew's piece in American Affairs uh, called "The Stock Market Model: A New Foundation for um, Economic and Monetary Policy." That that's a really good starting point for the ideas that that are in the book. So, um, I've. I wish you, uh, I hope you have a great 85th birthday, and I, I very much appreciate you joining us today. Um, so, Andrew Smithers, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I, if I can say as a small point, I work hard at answering serious questions as far as I can. If anybody wishes to email me on with questions they've had coming out of this, uh, I hope you will let them know uh, my email address, and they're very welcome to ask them. It's andrew at smithers.co.uk. Thank you very much. And Kevin, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I hope that we contribute pro bono uh, to an improvement <laughs> in economic philosophy and management as a result. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and with that, I'll uh, pass it back over to Niels. Thank you so much, Kevin and Andrew, for a very insightful and interesting conversation on a broad range of economic topics. 
Andrew's latest book, Economics of the Stock Market, touches on some really important topics because the current consensus economic model depends on assumptions that are shown to be invalid. Economic policy based on this consensus has led to the financial crisis of 2008, the Great Recession that followed, and the slow subsequent rate of growth. Instead, Andrew proposes a model that is robust when tested and by including the impact of the stock market on the economy overcomes both of these defects. I also really like the ideas that Andrew is thinking about for his next book, despite his mature age, namely how the standard growth model is impacted by the changes in the environment and how we really need investments in tangible assets. Make sure you go and follow Andrew and Kevin's work. Make sure you get a copy of their books, because as you can tell from today's conversation, some of these ideas and topics are not being discussed on mainstream media. From Kevin and me, thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to being back with you on the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.